And so if you haven't been here, we've actually been um, doing a series on Matthew, um, on the Gospel of Matthew, and it's called King Jesus. And we're basically going literally chapter by chapter, breaking down the book of Matthew. So some of us have been here from the beginning. Maybe if you haven't been here, it's okay because you can go on YouTube and watch it. And I highly recommend it, especially if you want to know what the gospel of Matthew is. Because every gospel, every gospel talks about Jesus in a different way. If you, want, if you know that, each gospel um, depicts Jesus in a different way. And so what we are learning in Matthew is that Jesus is the King Jesus. He is the Messiah. He is the one that was promised. He was the one that, that God promised the children of Israel that a king would come and reign. But not only reign in their, in, 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 in their lives, but reign forever. And so we know that that king is Jesus. We know that that king, that, mess, that messianic king is Jesus. And this is what we're reading about. We're reading about King Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I'm excited. As I've gone into reading, not only reading it, but also teaching it, it has really um, challenged me to just not read the surface of the Bible. And if you're just starting, that's okay. We're all in a, in, we're all in a, in a process. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't read the Bible, read the Bible. But the moment that you start digging into the word, you start realizing and you start, and you start seeing Jesus in everything. You start seeing God in every scripture and every word and the word becomes alive. And so this is what we're doing now. We are literally digging into the scriptures. We're digging into Matthew. We're literally putting ourselves in that moment where Jesus finally, Jesus comes and walks on the earth and he is speaking to the children of Israel. So that's where our mentality is right now. So if you were here Sunday, how many of you were here Sunday? How many were here Sunday? So if you know on Sunday, Deacon Josh um, did an amazing job and he um, did chapter six. I was a mess with the cup. I was a mess with that. Like he got me with that. Like I was like, oh no, 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 I don't wanna cry. But it was so beautiful. You were here. If you weren't here, watch it on YouTube. But he did such a beautiful job in explaining chapter 6. And when he talked about the kingdom of God, he talked about the kingdom of God. And he was able to explain the kingdom of God. And before I go ahead and just do a little quick recap, I want to just tell you where we are right now. So we've been talking about the Sermon on the Mount. How many of you know the Sermon on the Mount? The most famous sermon ever that Jesus, if, if you read Matthew, you will see like for three chapters, it's just red letters. And that's just Jesus like, he's just like spitting facts. He's like, he's just going and going. He's like, okay, I'm, I'm not done. I'm going to keep going. And it's like three chapters of God, of Jesus just teaching, teaching. But these are, these are teachings that are, that are valuable. These are teachings that are teaching us what is the kingdom of God and how to be a followers of Christ. So we've been talking about the Sermon on the Mount, right? So what we are in the Sermon on the Mount, let's put ourselves there. Let's pretend that Jesus is on a mountain and we're looking at him. There's a crowd of people. Like just imagine a crowd of people and you can imagine Jesus just speaking these truths. Like you've never heard, I don't know if you guys ever heard like a preacher, you're like, wow, like that was a good sermon like you're up there you're hype you're like you're writing notes you're like yes praise Jesus and you're like who is this person I've never heard this truth before you even like put it on your Instagram and all that stuff I don't know if you ever experienced I've experienced when I've listened to sermons and I'm like wow this is what's happening right now in the Sermon on the Mount there's two things happening with these people they're either saying wow or they're saying wait because Jesus is not only teaching, but he's confronting. He's confronting our thoughts. And we're putting, our, we're putting ourselves there too. He's confronting our thoughts. He's, our, he's confronting our hearts. He's showing us through the Sermon on the Mount that it's not about what you do, but it's the motive of the heart. It's about what's inside of you. So what Jesus is speaking to these people, he's not just speaking to speak, but he's trying to reveal their hearts. So can you imagine listening to this person, this person you have no idea who he is, and all of a sudden he's, he's just telling you a bunch of truths. 
And you're like, what is happening? Your heart is probably feeling something. You don't know what's happening. You're being confronted, but at the same time, you're like, no, I, I've never heard a person speak like this before. And in that time, they said, I've, they've never heard someone who, who, who spoke with such power and authority. Because the religious leaders didn't speak with truth and authority. They spoke out of self-righteousness. They spoke to condemn the people. For them to look better than the others. And Jesus is not, is not, is not representing that. He is not making himself better even though he is. Because he is God. But he is telling them, this is what it means to follow me. This is what it means, what it means of the kingdom of God. It is not what you think. It is not what the religious leader think, but it's what, it's what I'm saying right now. So this, right now what's happening, they're being transformed. Their mind is being blown by what is being said. And so we have learned throughout the, the, the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about how us as followers, we need to show love, humility, meekness forgiveness compassion we know that it is not a kingdom that is selfish self-centered it is not a kingdom that's self-righteous but he teaches us through the sermon on the mount he teaches us these things how we should model to be and so when josh spoke on sunday he continued to speak about the kingdom and he talked about that there is two kingdoms there is a kingdom of the world and there is the kingdom of god how many how many know that there are two kingdoms, and guess what? They are at war. Because the kingdom of the world is where we live now. The kingdom of the world is at war with the kingdom of heaven. They don't, the world doesn't want to see the kingdom of heaven come on earth. They don't want to see God be glorified. They don't want to see God be lifted high. They don't want to see, they don't want to see that. So there's, he talks about that there's two kingdoms. And he even says it in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. We are not of this world. The person next to you is not of this world. We are not of this world. We do not belong to the world. We belong to God. And so he is saying, my kingdom is from another place. Jesus is teaching us from the perspective, not of the world, but a perspective from heaven. This is what we need to see, that Jesus is teaching us from the perspective of heaven. He teaches us how to pray, and we learned in Matthew 6, 9 through 13, where Josh broke it down in such a way that there is no way that you cannot understand. He teaches us how to pray, how to pray to our Father. He teaches us, and we see that in, in Matthew 6, 9 through 13, we all know this prayer, our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us into temp lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. He has set uh, uh, what is that called like a example for us to, to pray. And if we begin to see that we begin to first acknowledge our Father, realize that he is holy, Realize that there's no one like him. And I love that it says, that it says, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. You see, if there wasn't two kingdoms, then why would Jesus say that? Why would Jesus say, let your kingdom come, let your will be done if there's no two kingdoms? So Jesus is saying, when we pray, we need to ask, Lord, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We must acknowledge him. And when we pray such prayers for his kingdom to come, what happens? When we begin to pray the will of the Father, when we begin to pray, Lord, let your kingdom come, that only happens, and Josh spoke about this, when we renew our minds. And we know that he talks a lot about this in Romans 12, 12, that it says, do not conform to the patterns of this world. Again, world, another kingdom. Do not, do not conform to what this world is thinks he is saying do not conform do not conform to what society is saying is right and what is wrong do not conform to what a celebrity is saying is right and wrong 
He is saying, do not conform to the patterns of this world because we have learned that the patterns of this world have led us to destruction, has led us to be away from God, has made us enemies of God because sin separates us. When we don't renew our minds, we won't be able to pray, Heavenly Father, our Father, let your kingdom come, let your will be done because we won't know what it is. And so Josh spoke that we must renew our minds. Tell the person next to you, renew your mind. And when we renew our minds, we begin to change. Our perspective begins to change. How does, has it happened to you before where you thought a certain way and then you realize like, oh wait, that's not right. And what happens? You begin to change somebody's car. <laughs> When you think a certain way, and I tell, I tell this to, to, to the youth, let me tell you something. The way you think now is not going to be the same in a year. It's not going to be the same in two years. It's not going to be, you're not going to think the same that you think now. What you think is right, right now, you're going to be like, wow, I was way off. Why? Because you're renewing your mind. You are changing. We are changing each and every day. But Jesus says that we must renew our minds. And so Josh taught us that when we renew our minds, we, we change our perspective. Our perspective is not of this world, but it's of heaven. And so we, we know that in Matthew 6, 25, it says that we will not worry about the earthly things. That we will not also, we won't store treasures in heaven. There is nothing wrong with desiring to be successful there because God wants us to be prosperous. But make sure that you are not trying to gain success and forget about God. Make sure that what you are doing, that you are including God. Because guess what? When we die, your clothes that you're wearing, that you paid so much money, is going to stay here. The car that you're like, oh my gosh, I'm saving up for this car, is going to stay here. Unfortunately, you're not going to be driving. I'm not going to be driving my car in heaven. I mean, maybe. Who knows? But maybe we get a better car. But everything is, every, every earthly possession is going to stay here. And we're here trying to be successful, trying to be known, trying to be rich, have three houses. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it's like, what's the point if God is not there? What's the point of being so successful if you lose yourself? What is the point of having riches if you are poor in your spirit? And so Jesus tells us, don't store treasures Store treasures in heaven. What are we doing to store treasures in heaven? He says that in Matthew 6, 19. And so we also know that Jesus is come to establish himself in our hearts. That he, doesn't, that he came to this world to establish ourselves, yes, as king, but king in our hearts. And it says it in, in Jeremiah 31, 33. He says, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law on their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. This is what God promised to the people of Israel. He says, when I come, I'm going to establish the law in your hearts. When I come, it is a new covenant that I am making. What is he saying? That I'm going to reign in your hearts. That is no longer a law that you read. It is, not, it is no longer a law that you feel like you have to fulfill. But he is saying, I'm going to be in your heart. That that is the most important thing is for him to reign in your heart. It is the new covenant with his people. That it doesn't come from a place of striving. It doesn't come a place from an outward performance. But it comes from a place of relationship. That is what God desires. In learning all of this. Jesus is saying, I don't care what you do. I care about what's inside of you. I care to be in a relationship with you. So can you imagine these people hearing something like this? Hearing that God is, is our father, that God desires to be in a relationship with us, that we will be inherit the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. These people are probably saying, what, what is he talking about? That he comes to change their perspective and say, guess what? Yes, you have felt God has been far away, but he has always been near. He has been near, and we have seen it through time and time again that Jesus, God, desired relationship with his people. 
From the beginning, he desired to be with us. From the beginning, he desired for creation to have a relationship with his creator. And so he is challenging his listeners that this kingdom being presented is not the kingdom that they thought or a kingdom that they have ever seen. And so as we continue the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7, I want you to open up your Bibles to Matthew 7, 7 through 8. We continue and we're finalizing the Sermon on the Mount. So what I just told you is like a recap of everything from chapter 5 and 6. And now we're in chapter 7. Where Jesus is concluding his message. He's concluding this sermon. And in chapter 7 he begins to teach us. We're going to talk about the judgment towards others. Prayer. He talks about the two roads that we must choose. He talks about false teachers and being true disciples. And what we must do with all these things that we have heard. And so he is doing this to emphasize the importance of fixing our eyes on what's above. He is emphasizing this so we can fix our eyes on the kingdom of God. And Jesus, we know that he modeled how to pray. But now he's going to teach us what happens when we pray. And this is what it says in Matthew 7, 7 through 8. If you're there, say amen. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receive. The one who seeks, find. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. So Jesus is telling us that if we seek him, we will find him. That if we knock the door, that he will open the door. What, God, what Jesus is saying here, Jesus is promising a radical attentiveness of God. That he is saying that if you search God, you will find him. That if you seek him, you will find him. That he is not a God that is far away. That he is not a God that if you cry out to him, he won't listen. And so this can sound very foreign to us because maybe some of us have said, but I have cried out to God and I don't feel like he's there. I don't know if that's happened to you. Where you've been in prayer and you're there praying. You could be for hours and hours and hours and you're just like, man, I'm not feeling anything. And you're like there trying to put music, worship music on and you're there praying and you're just like, oh my gosh, like is God even listening to me? Is God really there? He is. It's a promise that if we, if we seek him, we will find him. And maybe some of us have gone a little bit discouraged because it's not the way we think <laughs> that we will see God. That maybe we're asking for something. We're knocking so desperately. God, I need this. God, I need this car. God, I need this promotion. God, I need this. God. And we don't see it. So you're saying, oh, my God, but if I knock, it hasn't been open. I've been praying for five years. I've been praying for six years for a husband, and I'm still knocking. <laughs> I've been knocking the door. I've been knocking the door. And nothing, right? You can get discouraged. I'd be like, God, I've been knocking the door for me to, to, to move to this promotion in my, in my job, but it's, it's not happening. They get, someone else gets it, and then I'm just here in the same position. Or maybe you're asking God for, for maybe, I don't know, for school. I don't know, whatever it is. And you're knocking and knocking and knocking. You're being persistent. You're like, I'm knocking the door. I don't know if God is listening. I'm about to bust the door open. But sometimes we have to understand that it is not the way we think the door is going to be open. It is not going to be the way that God is saying, yeah, you will find me. But sometimes God is trying to find us in another way and where they're like, Trying to look him the same way that we've been seeking him. And so he talks about this and he says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. That those who seek from God will find. To those who knock, God will open the door. That God promises to be there. Moses tells this to the people of Israel to seek the Lord. In Deuteronomy 4.29, Moses tells this to the people of Israel before they go into the promised land. Before they go into the promised land, he tells them, remember the covenant that the Lord made with your ancestors. Remember the covenant. 
Do not worship idols and do not turn to your wicked ways. But he says, but seek the Lord and you will find him. He said, before you possess to go into this promised land, seek the Lord. Because guess what? There's going to be things happening. But if you seek the Lord, you will find him. Because he has made a covenant that he will be your God. And so he tells them, remember the covenant that God made with your people. Don't turn from him and seek him. And this is what he says in Deuteronomy 4.29. He says, but if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him. If you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. You see, God has shown us throughout the Bible that he is eager to have an intimate relationship and to provide what is good for us. He tells us, I'm providing this good thing, but I need you to seek me. But not only just seek me, he says, with all your heart and with all your soul. Meaning that you got to seek him in truth. You got to seek you got to seek him in truth. And we see this that God desires to have an intimate relationship in the garden of Eden. From the beginning God wanted relationship. God didn't have to create us, but he wanted a relationship. We see this with the children of Israel where God declares and this is where he's telling them that I will be your God and you will be my people. That is relationship. From the beginning, we see that God desires to be with us. That God desires to be close to us. So Moses tells them, seek them. Seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Seek him in truth. God answers sincere people that seek him in truth. When you seek him in truth... When you seek him with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and you begin to seek the Lord, you begin to knock, you will find him. That it won't be because of our selfish desires or the things that we want. But remember, when we change our perspective, when we renew our minds, when we seek the Lord because of who he is and not what he can give us, you will find him. When you knock, he will open the door. And so Moses tells them, seek him in truth. If you search for him, you will find him because he is a good father. He is a good father that wants the best for us. And how do we know that? How do we know that he really does want the best for us? Well, if we read, if we keep reading in the same chapter, Matthew 7, 9 through 11. Look what Jesus says. He says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give, give good gifts to those who ask him? Jesus tells us, human beings are nature, are, are, um, are sinful by nature. And even they know how to give good gifts. So how much more... Your father who is in heaven, who is perfect, will give you good gifts. We have to remember that, that when we are seeking the Lord, that he will give us good things. That it may not be what you think is good, but he desires the best for you. Because he is a loving and generous giving father. I think about... When I was young and I used to ask my parents for stuff and they'd be like, no, no. I remember for my sweet 15 that I never got. And if they're going to watch this, I'm going to remind them again. But I remember for my sweet 15, they said, okay, do you want a party or do you want the money? How many of you have had a sweet 15 here? Sweet 16. It's expensive. So me, 15-year-old, I'm like, wait, hold up. Money? That's going to be a lot of money that I'm getting. And so I was like, I want the money. I don't want to, I don't want to quince, how we say it in Spanish. I thought about the money that I was going to get. I'm like, bro, I'm going to be so rich in my mind because at 15 I had no job. Like $20 for me, I was like, whoa, I'm banking. <laughs> like I want to go out with $20 and make, multiply it like the fish bread. <laughs> 
And I remember I asked for the money, and guess what? I never got the money. I never got the money. But it's okay because my parents said it's coming with interest in my, in my wedding. You know why? Because they're like, if we would have given you the money, you would have spent it on things that didn't even, that, that's very true. I probably would have spent it on food, literally food, because that's all you do when you're 15. You eat, you eat, and you go out. And instead of having, you know, that special quince or whatever, I was like, I want the money because I want to be rich. But my parents realized, like, okay, that money, I don't, I don't think it's beneficial for you to have it right now. How many of us have asked our parents when they're like, no, not right now. And you're like, oh, my God, I want a car. But it's like, remember the freedom that you have when you have, when you have a car. Your parents know when you're ready, when you're not ready. God is the same way. When we ask for something, God is saying, hold up. <laughs> you're not ready for that yet. You're not ready for that. Or he can say, I have something better. We have to trust that God has the best interest for us. That when we ask him and we seek him, that we know that God is a good father. And in doing this so, some of us, and I have heard this, this verse turned into a, into a, 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 a like a, just a, what is that called? Like you're like God, like Jesus is a genie and you're like, I'm going to ask for this and I'm going to get it. And I'm going to knock and I know that God says that if I knock, I'm going to, that he's going to open the door. And if I ask, I will receive and all this stuff. Like, like it's like a blank check that God gives us and we're there just writing stuff and just checking, like cashing it out. That's not what this verse means. Jesus is not a genie. Jesus is not, a, yes, he wants to give us the things that we desire, but we have to ask, is it according to his will? That is the most important part. Is it according to the will of God for you to ask what you are asking for? That instead of asking what you want, ask God what he wants for you. That if you're like, I want to be in a relationship, God, how about you ask him, God, who am I? Who have you called me to be? God, I want a car. How is your finances? Ask him, Lord, help me with my finances. That when we ask for these, these things, these things do matter because we need a car here in Florida. Absolutely. We're not in New York. <laughs> we need a car to get from point A to point B here or else you will melt but yes, we, 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 we ask for those things, but ask the Lord, God, is, is this the right time for me in a relationship or your job? Is this taking me away from you, God? Is this your will for me that I'm asking you, I'm asking you, but it's not coming? God, is there something better for me? When we come to God, we realize, and when we ask, we know that he will give us good things. Because he loves us. So when you go to him, trust and know that God wants the best for you. That just how your parents sometimes say no to you because they have the best interest in you, it's the same thing with God. But God's love is beyond. <laughs> it is beyond. He is, your parents can see like a mile ahead, but God is like, hello. He, he is the beginning and he is the end. So he knows so trust the Lord. Trust that when you do seek him with truth, when you seek him for who he is, you will find him. Don't stop seeking him. You will find him. It is a promise. It is a promise. So when you begin to seek this truth, when you begin to knock at the door, when you begin to ask Jesus, when you begin to seek Jesus, what happens? Truth begins to be revealed in your lives. Truth begins to be revealed in your, in your lives and you start saying, wait, there's some things that I shouldn't be doing anymore. There's some things that I, I need to change the way I do this now. I need to change the way that I speak now. Because truth has come into your heart. We, want to, we don't want to be the same person anymore. We don't want to 
we start realizing maybe I shouldn't hang around with these people too much. Maybe I should stop doing this because I know this is not good for me. When we begin to seek truth, truth is revealed to us. And so Jesus tells us when you begin to, to seek truth, you will find yourself at a crossroad. And this is where he talks about the narrow and broad road. Jesus describes that there are two roads that we will take in our lives. One is accessed by a narrow gate and one with a wide entrance. And it says it in Matthew 7, 13 through 14. He says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. It is so much easier to do your own will. It is so much easier to do what you want to do, to have the freedom to do. That's why the road is broad. That's why the road, the entrance is huge. Why? Because you have room to do whatever you want. You can go here. You can go over there. You're like, no, I'm going to do this today. You know what? No, I'm going to serve God now. No, I'm going to go over here. And then you're... You, you can do whatever you want. You can say, I, I want to choose, I'm going to choose to obey my parents today. Or I'm going to choose to be a good person today and not tell somebody off in the streets. We have so many ways that we can go when there's a wide entrance. When we choose to do our own freedom, our own will. But it says that it leads to destruction. When we choose to do our own thing, when we choose to go our own way, we could choose that path today, and then we could choose our other path. And the world's like, choose your own path. Choose what you want to do. What do you want to do? It's not about what God wants. And so he tells us this road, this broad road, leads you to destruction. And Jesus acknowledges that many will take the easier path. Many people will take the, easy, the easier path because it's easier to have more space than to be in literally one road. One road, just one road. Be like, wait, but that road is bigger. Why don't I just go over here? It makes more sense. I have more room to move. But Jesus says that there are some people that will take the wider road. But he says here, Enter through the narrow gate. He is saying, enter through this gate. That yes, it may be tiny. Maybe it may be a little bit uncomfortable. Maybe you may feel like you're closing in. But understand that there is life in this road. Understand that when you choose this road, it is difficult. Why? Because you have to turn away from your sins. You have to turn away from what you want. You have to turn away from your own desires. You have to turn away from your selfish ways. And you choose to follow him. You choose to take the narrow path. Why? Because it leads to life. It's not going to be easy. That's why it's narrow. But Jesus says there is life in this path. It's hard. It's so hard to be a Christian. Oh my God, you don't understand, Karina. Like, it's just hard because, like, the world and, like, everything is just so easy to do now. That's the way the enemy wants it to look like. He wants you to think that the world is easier to follow than to, than to follow God. But when we, we know, and Jesus says it, it leads to destruction, and we see this with the people of Israel. They chose time and time again when God set them a path and they decided to go another way and it led to destruction to the nation. It led to them being separated by God. And what about us when before we came to God, we were in the path of destruction too. We were in a path that was leading us to death. But then we realized when Jesus came into our lives, 
When Jesus came and encountered us, that there was a better road to follow than our own road. That there was a better road than the road that is leading you to emptiness, that is leading you to addiction, that is leading you to brokenness, that is leading you to depression, that is leading you to anxiety. Because that's what leads you when you do things on your own. You find yourself alone and broken and lost. I was. But when Jesus came into my life, I realized that he was the way, that he was the truth, and that he was the life. Like it says it in John, in John, uh, where is it, where is it, where is it? E. John 14, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is saying, I am the way. I am the way. I am the way that will lead you to life. What path are we taking? Jesus says there's only two. What path are we taking? Are we taking our own path? Do you feel like you got a lot, that you could do a lot right now? Probably to check yourself. If you feel like you have a lot of room to do stuff, you're like, mm, I'm going to just do this today. Ask yourself, what road am I walking? What path am I taking? Because if you're taking the narrow path, if you're taking the path that Jesus says, you're leading, it's leading you to life. It's leading you to eternity. It's leading you to abundance of joy. It's leading you to patience, to peace, to, to blessings. This is what it means to follow God. That we are not only, we only, he only gives us life, but that we get to fellowship, that we get to be with him in this road, that we are not alone. Because in this other path, we've been alone, but here, Jesus is with us. So he says, I am the only way. I am the path that leads to life. Jesus is the only way. And Jesus tells us, he warns us that there are many who will try to guide us through that destructive path. And he calls them false prophets, false teachers. He tells us to be, beware of those false prophets. And he says it in Matthew 7, 15 through 16. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Jesus warns us to be careful not to be led astray from those who pretend to deliver a message from God. He tells us, be careful. And he tells us how to identify these false teachers, these false prophets. He tells them you will identify them by the results of their lives and teaching, by their fruits. That is how you will identify that we should pay attention to the manner of their living. We should pay attention. Do they show righteousness, humility, forgiveness, faithfulness in the way that they live? We should pay attention to the content that they, that, of the things that they are teaching. Is it true from the word of God? Or is it distorted truth? Is it centered on self? Is it tickling your ear to do whatever you want because God will forgive you anyways? What is the content of the things that you are hearing? Pay attention to the effect of their teaching. Are you being transformed? What fruits are coming out of your lives from what you are hearing from these people? Are you growing or are you being entertained? Why is it important to see these fruits? Jesus says, healthy trees don't bear bad fruit. Not every, be careful, especially now, that I've just seen so many 
teaching, so many videos of, of distorting who Jesus is. That it really breaks my heart. For people to say things about who Jesus was when it's, that's not who he is. People who are preaching, it's okay to do this. It's okay to live like this. It's okay to listen to this. It's okay to watch this. It's okay to live like this. It's okay because I think it's okay. But what does the Bible say? Jesus is saying, be, be aware of those that are tickling your ear. That, that you say, wait, I, didn't, I, thought that was, I thought that wasn't okay to say or I thought that wasn't okay to do. Especially with new age. There's so many ways that people are mixing it with God. And even people who are Christians believing in things that is not from God. And I'm like, God, how has this happened that we have let your truth be distorted to because of what we think, because of what we, what we think is true? Which is that it's not about what you think. It's about what I say. It's about what is in the word of God that is truth. It is not about what you think is right or wrong because we are flawed. We, we have, yes, amen, we have no right to say what is right and wrong. We are sinful in nature. <laughs> we have to go to the word to say, God, what is right and what is wrong? What, what do you say about this matter? What do you say about living this way? That is what we have to go to. Jesus says, by their fruits, you will know them. He says, in 18, Matthew 7, 18 through 20, he says, A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Lord, have mercy. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not is not only those that we hear or that teach, but it's also in our lives too. Because this fruit is the inevitable result of who we are. The fruit that we produce is who we are. So Jesus says, are you producing good fruits or are you producing bad fruits? What fruit are you producing? And maybe at this time, like, oh, well, I don't see anything wrong with that. Give it time because guess what? Fruits take time. Eventually with time, you will realize if that was a good fruit or a bad fruit. Don't just judge something just right there and then. And that's vice versa, judging if it's good or not. Let it grow. Sometimes you may, oh, but this person doesn't like a bad person. Look at their fruits. That is what Jesus is telling us. Be careful and look at the fruits that they are producing. And we see this in the Garden of Eden. That this fruit looked good and tasty. This fruit that the serpent presented to Eve was a tasty. It wasn't, she wasn't saying, ew, why would I want a rotten apple or a rotten fruit? No, it was a juicy fruit. And he was saying to her, eat it. It looked desirable. It looked like a good fruit. But what happened when they ate from that good fruit? Sin entered their heart. So not everything that looks good is good. And that is what we as children of God have to learn to discern. Learn to discern the fruit in our lives and learn to discern the fruit in other people's lives. Be careful, like I said, what you listen to and who you listen to. Eventually that which sounds and looks good can, can eventually lead you to destruction. It could lead you to confusion ask the holy spirit ask god god is this you is this according to your word now in saying this i'm not saying that you guys are all gonna go off and start judging people's fruits you're like mm, that's a bad fruit no no i'm not hanging with her i'm not hanging with him because that's a bad fruit he has bad fruits 
We're going around looking at people's fruits and judging. Like, okay, she's a good fruit. I'm going I'm to I'm hang with her. I'm not saying that we should be looking and, like, trying to judge people. I'm not saying that. Jesus even warns us about judging others. And he says it in, John, in, in Matthew 7. We're going all the way to the top. One, one through two, he says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He's saying that we must judge ourselves first. That the same measure we judge others, we need to judge ourselves. And I was looking into this, and Jesse also sent me a, a video, because a lot of people take specifically this verse out of context. Say, well, the Bible says don't judge me, so you can't judge me. How many have heard that? I've said it, don't judge me. The Bible says you can't judge me. That's not what the Bible says. It says, for the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use... It will be measured to you. That is true. We are not God. We can't condemn you. But as children of God, we must discern what is right and wrong. That there's nothing wrong with telling someone, hey, I don't think that's a good idea. Or listen, I don't think you should do this. Or you know what, maybe I don't think you should have said that. It's discerning what is good and what is wrong. That's love. That is what Jesus is talking about here. If we are to judge others, it's to discern what is right and what is wrong. We must do it in a way that when we judge them in a sense of not condemnation, it's not condemnation. Because what he is saying, don't condemn people. He's saying, yes, you can judge. judge. Judge what is happening. But you judge out of love, out of compassion, not harshly or self-righteously. That the way that you judge yourself, because we, we don't judge ourselves the way we judge people. I know I don't. Oh, my goodness. I, I'm like, mm, they're lost. Nope. They're not yeah, they're not going back to church. I saw them on Instagram. We don't judge ourselves that way. <laughs> we do things that nobody knows, only God knows, and we're not like, man, God, of course we feel bad, but we're not there, you know, saying we're not going to come back to church. We're like, God, I, I, I messed up. Lord, I, I did this and I shouldn't have done it, but Lord, I repent and I come to you, Father. We pray. It's the same way that we need to do to those around us. It is not condemning them, but it's loving them and showing them and telling them what you are doing is not right. But it's coming out of love. Not because you think you're better than them. Because none of us are better than anyone here. Sorry. If you thought, I'm sorry. But none of us. No one, no, the person next to you is not more righteous. We're all sinners. We all need God. We all need God. And so he tells us this. If you judge, judge the way you judge yourself. With love, compassion, not harshly or self-righteously. And Jesus was a perfect example of this. Because do you remember the response of Jesus to those who had brought the woman who was caught in the act of adultery? Do you remember in the story what Jesus did? He says, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Those people were ready to stone her. They were condemning her. They brought her out to kill her. Literally to stone her to death. And Jesus, the one who can throw the stone, didn't throw a stone, but showed mercy and forgiveness. That is what Jesus asked for us, from us as children. That we're not there dragging someone to condemn them and to throw a stone at them. 
but that we're there to say, I'm here. I am too a sinner. Let me pray for you. I'm not throwing a stone at you because I'm not worthy. This is the way we need to judge others. Judge others the way Jesus, with compassion, with love, and with mercy. And sometimes that's not easy because the flesh is the flesh. And sometimes it's so easy to talk about people. Oh, my goodness. It, is, it just comes out sometimes. You're like, oops. You're like, ooh, bad mouth, bad mouth. But Jesus says, judge yourself. Judge others how you judge yourself. Tell the person next to you, be careful. We cannot judge to condemn because when we do that, we become arrogant against others and ignorant to ourselves. Jesus says it in Matthew 7, 3 through 5. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there was a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. Ouch. Ooh. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus was not playing. Jesus was not playing. He says, before you go and take the speck, take the log. There's another one that says log, another translation. Do you know what a log is? He says, take the log out of your eyes. Some of us can be like that. We could be so judgmental. And Jesus is like, hey, have you checked the log in your eye? You're there trying to judge this person, but you're here struggling the same way. And Jesus is saying, how about you take care of what's in your eye? And then you can go to this person. Because you know what happens when we do that? When we realize that we're sinners, we have compassion toward the person that is failing. Toward the person that is not doing the right thing. We have so much compassion. Why? Because we looked at the log in our eye. And so Jesus says, look at the log in your eye first. Before you look at the speck in someone's eye. Jesus commands us to be merciful. To be compassionate. To be loving. In other words, followers of Jesus have no right to declare someone is beyond God's mercy. Jesus did not write off the woman as beyond redemption. But instead, like I said, he showed forgiveness and mercy. And only after a person has addressed their own sin and admitted their own condition can they help others address their sin. Even then, the goal is to help and not to condemn. So therefore, before asking of anyone else, we should first ask ourselves, do I bear fruit unto God's glory? Am I bearing good fruits? Because it's not so much about what we do, but it's our relationship with God that will produce the good fruits. Because you can do things for God and think it's a good fruit and have a tree filled with many fruits, good fruits. But Jesus here compares to someone who thinks they have done right by God by their spiritual accomplishments, but their spiritual life has nothing to do with their daily lives. And he says this in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Jesus warns, man. And says, not everyone that calls me Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he says, those who do the will of my Father. And you could say, but they prophesied, they casted out demons, they did so many wonders. 
Yes, these are wonderful things. And Jesus is not saying that we shouldn't prophesy. He's not saying that we shouldn't pray for the healing, for the sick. He's not saying that, that we shouldn't do these wonder, wondrous things. But what he's saying is it means nothing if there's not a relationship. It means nothing if there's not a connection with Jesus. It means nothing if you are not living a life that is according to his will. That yes, you can prophesy. Yes, you can be the prophet of many nations. Yes, you have the gift of discernment. Yes, you have the gift of healing. Yes, when you prayed for someone, they got saved. Glory to God. That is amazing. But check your heart. Because at the end, he says on that day... On that day when you come to him and you show him your fruits of spiritual accomplishments and you say, God, look what I did. He says, depart from me. Because Jesus did not come for the outward, but he came for your heart. This is what Jesus is trying for them to understand. It's not what you do. And if you do it, do it for the glory of God, not for people to see you. Not for people to say how spiritual you are. But that because you truly desire to see the kingdom of God here on earth. That when we come before God, that we're not saying, God, look what I did. But we say, God, thank you because you have let me in. Thank you, God, because I didn't deserve it, but, Lord, I am here before you. And that on that day that we can go before him and that he accepts us in. That is what we need to strive for. That is what we need to, 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 to desire. Remember, this is temporary. This earth is temporary. This life is temporary. But Jesus, through Jesus, we have eternity. So ask yourselves this. Why do I do the things that I do? Am I doing it for people to see me? For the Lord to see me? Or is it because I truly desire to see his kingdom? Because I truly desire to see God in every person and every family member and every friend that I have and every person that I cross the street with or the road or whatever that I desire to see God in their lives. Why do we do the things that we do? We can do it all on the things in the name of Jesus, but it means nothing if we don't have a relationship with him. In the end, there's one basis of salvation and it's not just confession and it's not just spiritual works, but it's knowing Jesus and being known by him. It's our connection to him, the gift of faith that he gives to us that secures our salvation. Connected to Jesus, we are secure. Without connection to him, all miracles and great works prove nothing. Are we connected to him? When we pray when we go out and pray for the sick, when we go out and pray for the lost, are we connected to him? Are we doing this for him? Or are we doing this for ourselves? Overall, Jesus' message is, is about how to live as a follower and how to serve as a member of, of God's kingdom. In many ways, Jesus' teaching during the Sermon on the Mount represents major ideals of a Christian life. How us, as Christians, as children, should walk. In hearing all of this, Jesus tells us what happens when we hear all of this. To not judge others the way, you know, we judge others the way we, should, we judge ourselves. That if we do things, we do it with love, that we should be humble, that we should, be, that we should forgive, that we should turn the other cheek, that we shouldn't, we shouldn't talk about others, that we shouldn't, we shouldn't gossip about others, that we should strive to be with God, to have a relationship with him. Out of all of this that we have learned through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells them, this is what happens if you put to practice what I am teaching you. And we're going to read in Matthew 7, 24 through 27. I'm ending here. 
He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because, because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Jesus says, if you put these teachings, if you put what I have taught you into practice, it is a firm foundation. That he is not just speaking to speak, but he is laying down a foundation on how we should live our lives. Jesus' sermon concludes with an illustration on emphasizing the difference between hearing Jesus, hearing Jesus' teaching about the kingdom of God and being a follower of Christ and fully living by it. He says that those who apply his word are like a wise man who built a house on a rock. Those who who don't are like a foolish man who built a house on a sand. He has set a foundation that if we are wise, we will set that foundation in our lives to keep us firm. That keeps us firm when the storms of life come knocking at our house. And how do we do that? Jesus says, whoever hears, whoever hears these words and puts it into practice, meaning we must not only hear and read the word, but we must practice what we hear and what we read. That we must not just act, but that we also keep it in our hearts. Jesus lays a foundation for us that if that we, we may build upon it daily in our lives to seek after the heart of God, to seek after his kingdom, to seek to reflect him here on earth. In the end, Jesus has made it clear that his followers should live a life that is noticeably different than other people. Because his followers hold a higher standard. The standard of love and selflessness. Jesus himself embodied when he died on the cross for our sins. He embodied love and selfishness. Selflessness, not selfishness. This is what Jesus is teaching us. He is saying, don't just hear what I'm telling you, but put into practice. Let it stay in your hearts. And when it becomes living in your heart, you begin to act. You see, when he teaches us these teachings, it is to change us. It is to change the way we think. It is to change the way we walk. It is, a it is to change the way we love others. It is a model. It is the way that Jesus models for us to live as a Christian. To live as a follower of Christ. To live a life that is selfless. To live a life that forgives to live a life that is merciful, to live a life that loves. Not a love that you can give, but only the love that God can give. And that love we can only give if we have God in our hearts. The only way you can love someone that's your enemy is God. The only way you can love someone that talks about you the only way that you can love someone that gossips about you, that maybe treats you bad, is God. That's the only way. That's the only way that we can love is with the love of God. And so I ask you to stand. 
And as we reflect on what we have heard today, but not only today, but throughout these teachings, that Jesus spoke on a mountain. He spoke to a crowd of people that were tentative to what he was listening to what he was saying. They were listening to every word, every truth that was coming out of his mouth. That is what is happening when we read the Bible. When we read the scriptures, it's God's very words, how Josh said on Sunday. It is the mind of God. It is the heart of God. The teachings, the word that we read, it is what God desires for us. It is what God wants for us. And so as we reflect on these teachings, as we reflect on the words that Jesus has spoke, can we ask him that these words come alive into our lives? That these words not only, that these words don't fall on thorny ground, but that they fall on a fertile ground. That we may not just let go so easily of what we have learned and let it be taken away from us because of what happens in our lives, but that may we hold it because these are the very words of God the things that he desires for you. Understand that he loves you. He loves you very much. And he doesn't want you to live the same way. He doesn't want you to think the same. He doesn't want you to act the same. He wants you to be new. He wants you to renew your mind. He wants to renew your heart. He wants to change your mind of, of thinking that you are no one to someone. To think that you are an orphan but that you are a child. To take that mindset of being rejected to accepted. To being loved instead of hated. That is who God wants you to realize who you are. He wants you to realize that your life can be better. That he has a better plan for you. That he has a better path for you. But it's only if you choose. If you choose to follow him. Jesus is at the door. He says, if you knock, you will find him. If you knock at the door, if you sincerely want to change, you sincerely want life because you have felt that your life has been meaningless, has been worthless, that you're living day by day, and that you feel this heaviness, that you feel dead inside, if you knock, you will find life. If you knock and you will open, you will find purpose. You will find love. You will find forgiveness. That is who Jesus is. Ask him tonight. Jesus, am I being a follower? Am I bearing good fruits, God? Am I reflecting your nature, your character? Am I a reflection of who you are to those around me? In the way that I speak, 
in the way that I, that, that, that I do life. God, does it reflect you? Does it reflect your word? And if it doesn't, Lord, teach me. I am knocking at the door. I am seeking you. Because I know, Lord, that if I seek you, I will find you. If you seek him, you will find him. If you seek him, you will find him. God is not a God that is far away. He is there. And so, Father, right now, Lord, I pray for each and every person that is here, God. Lord, I ask that each and every word, God, each and every word that was spoken, Lord, right now, Father, that it may fall in their hearts, God. That they may cherish, Lord, your words, God. And for those, Lord, who don't know who you are, God, that they are knocking at the door, Father, that they may find you, Jesus. That they may find what they are looking for. That they may find the purpose. That they may find who they are, God, and that is only in you, Jesus. That no longer will they feel dead and empty inside, but God, that they will feel whole again, Father. That they will feel, that they will know that they have encountered life. And that every dead thing, God, in their life comes to life right now in Jesus' name. And for those that maybe have felt discouraged, God, that have said, God, I have, I have tried and tried and I can't and I can't, God. Lord, show them, Father, that you are there. And show them, Lord, that they are not far away. That you are with them. Teach us, God. Teach us, Lord, to be more like you, Jesus. Remove, God, every selfish way, God. Every, every self-righteousness that we have that we think that we're better than someone just because we know more or we do more, God. Remove that. Remove that, Lord. That is not from you, God. Lord, remove anything that we have against each other, God. Remove, Lord, any, any bitterness, God, any envy, Father. Remove it, Lord, because it is not from you, God. But, Lord, that we be able to forgive those that hurt us, that we may love those that talk bad about us, God, because that is who you have called us to be. That instead of condemning, Lord, that we pray, we pray for our brothers and our sisters. Teach us to be more like you, God. Teach us to be more like you, Jesus. Show us, Father, through your word, God. Through your word, Lord, show us. Teach us. Because we know, God, that you have spoken. So we ask you, Lord, that you open up our eyes, open up our ears, God. And let us draw close to you again. We draw close to you again, God. If maybe we have felt apart, God, we are here now. We are here now, Lord, before your presence, Jesus. Make us more like you. Make us more like you. We want to be like you, God. We want to be the salt and the light of the earth. Teach us, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord, for this moment. I pray for each and every person, God. You know their circumstances. You know their situation, Lord. May they know, God. May they leave knowing that you, God, are with them. And that you are a good father. And that no matter what they see, no matter what they feel, you are greater, Father. And that they are not far from you. That you are close to them. 
Protect them, Lord. Protect us, God. Protect us, Jesus. And let us continue to walk. Let us continue to walk this path that you have set. That we fix our eyes on you, Lord. We fix our eyes on the kingdom. We fix our eyes on you, King Jesus. And we live our lives according to your will. Teach us, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen.